Following the defeat of the last wave, we have mail from Leos, informing us of the cursed wave's next location. We must make our way to the next server location to meet up for a new plan. Returning to the Sigma server, we are met with Elk. He is asking if we know where Mia is at, telling us that she was right here. Distraught, he starts to assume we know of her whereabouts, demanding we tell him where she is. We tell him that we don't know where she is, that we just arrived in town. Elk believes our words, but demands that if we see her, that we tell him immediately, to which we agree to inform him, and then he proceeds to log out. Out. Heading to the Omega server, it has faint signs of white noise. The server has a large flight of stairs with trees and lanterns parallel to it. When we arrive, the server has no sign of player activity. As we begin to walk, suddenly the server begins to violently shake, a sign of the next wave. Helva comes to our aid, informing us that the area has become too dangerous and will warp us out of the area. Arriving at the net slums, Helba, Leos, and Wiseman welcome us. Helba informs us that she mirrored the Omega server with her own. Leos, unaware of the change, tells Helba that he can't let his guard down for even one minute, but she reassures him they are safe because of her mirrored server. Wiseman starts off our next strategy meeting, telling us that the wave is still moving at this point in time, and if it becomes difficult to determine the wave's location, that we should specify its movement. We chime in and mention that our friend Orca told us before, that killer whales create an enclosure when hunting their prey, to close any escape paths. However, if there's no place for the prey to run, then they will disperse, so they create an escape route on on purpose, to lure the prey to where it is most convenient. Black Rose asks what we mean by most convenient, to which we answer her question, the surface. It's a dead end for the prey. So, if our enemy is moving, I might be able to apply it. Helbo thinks that it is a good plan. Wiseman mentioned that after analyzing the virus core provided by Leos, Helbo will be developing a vaccine program. The vaccine won't be able to destroy the wave, but it may be able to corner it. She then asks if we are going to have enough people for the plan. Leos says that it won't be a problem. He'll have his employees that he trusts do it. Helba points out we'll just have more pigheads. Balmung says, putting pigheads aside, what we need to do is prepare for the operation. Leos mentioned that he would like to measure the data fluctuation. He asks that we investigate a field, and with that, the meeting is adjourned. The field Leos wants us to investigate is locked, so we hack the gate and make our way through. The dungeon has a data bug, so we data drain it and learn the ability Drain Heart. After the data bug has been removed, Leos tells us the mission is complete. Looking at the news, hospital equipment had started to be become non-operational. No one was seriously affected, however, this was the hospital our friend Orca was located at after they became comatose. Logging back in, Black Rose waits for us near the gate. She brings up the news article about the hospital equipment becoming non-operational, and thinks it's related to what we are doing. She thinks how she would feel if this were to happen at the hospital her brother Kazu is located at, who also fell into a coma. We tell her that we want to get rid of the wave from this world as soon as possible, but we're all finally on the same team. It'll all work out as long as we stay patient. Black Rose is just concerned for Orca and Kazu. We let her know that Orca is doing alright. She begins to ask if the hospital that was affected was the one that Orca was staying in, but we quickly go ahead and start to talk with Spiritus, who is also waiting at the gate. They tell us that while they were pondering on various issues, they came to the conclusion that they will help us. They tell us of a strange room in a dungeon. Then, they tell us that we may be able to change this world. The field Spiritus gave us is protected, so we unlock it. While making our way through the dungeon, a voice calls out to us. It says, Evolution does not always mean progress. Evolution sometimes leads to an undesired vector. It is arrogant for one to reject change because it is undesirable. Rejection of change is the rejection of possibilities. Allow diversity. Exploring further, we arrive in a room with a single tree at dusk, the leaves falling from the tree, and a figure of a woman wearing a dress while holding an umbrella. However, the woman is transparent and cannot be seen. A voice calls out, Over the Keel Mountains, meets an ape with human speech. The ape asks, What clings to you? Bear it, you cannot. Accept it, you cannot. But hidden, it is from you. Recite its name. We then receive Epitaph 04. Back in town, Elk waits near the gate. He says that he can't find Mia anywhere. We tell him that maybe she stopped playing the game, but he tells us that there's no way she would stop playing. Black Rose suggests that Elk help us out, saying that if Mia is still in the game, there may be a chance to find her that way. Elk agrees and says that Mia likes this type of stuff, so it's decided. Elk will help us in hopes of crossing paths with Mia. Checking our mail, we receive messages from Pyro and Moonstone. Pyros wants help with a player who scammed him in a dungeon with price gouging, and Moonstone mentions a dungeon that would be good to level up in, and wants us to come with. Grouping with Pyros, we see the player who scammed him. Pyros mentions that the player was the one who sold him, I mean, his 
friend, an expensive item. The player recognizes Pyrrhos from before, and brings up that he gave too much money for a healing item, so he refunds the extra amount for the item back to him. Pyrrhos brings up how it was his, I mean, his friend's mistake that they overpaid. Regardless, he'll thank the player on his friend's behalf. The player is confused what Pyrrhos means by his friend. It was Pyrrhos who, but Pyrrhos interrupts, claiming him and his friend have similar designs. Anyway, uh, he must correct the misunderstanding and return the money to which he proceeds to log out. The player and I just sit there quietly before logging out. We go with Moonstone to the dungeon he suggested to level up in. As soon as we enter the dungeon, we come across another player. They mention that the monsters here are strong and wishes for our safety. Further in the dungeon, Moonstone expresses another reason for coming to the dungeon other than leveling up. When we ask what the other objective could be, he retreats and just asks for us to not mind what he was about to say. When we open the final treasure box, we acquire an item called Marine Spear. Moonstone requests that we give him the spear. We agree, but point out that it is unusual that he would request a weapon that he cannot use. We hand over the item to Moonstone. He thanks us and also requests that we return back to the beginning of the dungeon. We go back to the other player we met earlier. Moonstone seems nervous talking with them. They are able to recall Moonstone from before. Moonstone offers the Marine Spear to the player as a trade, which surprises them that we have it. He suggests it be traded with the Moon Helm item. The player agrees and is surprised that Moonstone remembers that they were looking for the Marine Spear. Nervously, Moonstone tries to downplay the effort that was needed to retrieve the item, to not make it sound like a big ordeal. The two finish their trade, and the player logs out. We are alone with Moonstone, and we tease him about what the other objective truly was. He asks that we don't tell anyone about what happened, and gives us the rare dual blade weapon, prepared to die. Wise Man messages us, letting us know that we are assembling in town to go over the next operation. Once in town, we notice the absence of Leos. Helba mentions that he and his men are already in position. According to Leos, his men have been able to pinpoint the location of the next wave, and they will encircle it as soon as it appears, then use the vaccines to restrict it from moving. Wise Man gives us the field we plan to fight the wave at. He asks what the operation will be called, to which we call it Operation Orca. Everyone understands what they need to do, and the meeting concludes. Hellbuck gives us a virus core to access the field. Hacking the gate, we arrive in the field. Leos opens communications to us, letting us know the wave will be arriving in the location soon. Once we reach the wave's location, something seems off. There isn't anything here. Here. Leos also notices the odd behavior. The way that it was being herded is strange. We ask for Leos to clarify. He says how the data volume of the wave is diminishing. It just vanished. The target has lost all sighting. It doesn't make any sense. Helba picks up an abnormal data volume in another field. If we hurry, we can still make it. We rush over. Ahead of our arrival, we can see Mia and Elk in the dungeon. Mia, curled on the floor, asks Elk who they are. Elk, who's just happy to see Mia, tells her that she is Mia, of course. Mia claims to have no memory. Elk doesn't know how to respond. Mia says, while beginning to tremble, that they only exist in the world. The only memories that they have are when they are in the world. She then starts to yell, No! Stop it! While gripping their head as they start to thrash their body around. Elf begins to become concerned about what is happening with Mia. Mia feels as if something is happening outside of their control and says they want to stay the way they are. We arrive in the room that Mia and Elk are in. Mia yells, telling us to stay back for what is about to happen. Her current form begins to dissolve, and she begs us not to look at her and what she's about to become. Her final words in her current form are an apology to Elk. Their body starts to spread and span on the floor, flesh-like with eyes. The room transforms, and the fleshy floor flips upwards into a ball, surrounding Mia. The noise begins to play, and the flesh unfurls, revealing Mia's new form. The power erupts, knocking Elk back. We are able to brace ourselves soon enough to not get blasted back. Elk gets up and calls out to Mia, with the last bit of Mia that still remains, forces Elk out of the room. And with that, Mia has become the next phase of the wave, Maha the Temptress. Maha can use Earthquake that hits the ground and damages all party members close to the impact. It can also cast a spell that rains fireballs down onto a single target. It can also use ice magic. It surrounds a target with ice and erupts, hitting any player who are close enough to the target. It can use earth magic. It bends the earth around the target, hitting them multiple times, with each layer of earth growing larger, hitting any other player close to the target. It can cast confusion onto a target, causing a party member to attack either enemy or ally. Sprite of Love. It concentrates a large energy ball that they launch at a target and damages anyone else who's close by. Suspicious Seduction. It charms all teammates, causing everyone to attack one another until only one player remains to pick everyone else back up. And Data Drain, which applies every single debuff onto a single target of its choosing. Once weak enough, you can use Data Drain to reduce it down to its stone form. In its stone form, it can still use Earthquake, Fire Magic, and Confusion. 
It can also use lightning magic that'll strike a single target. The rock structure begins to crumble apart, but one rock, as it breaks apart, reveals Mia's old body hiding from within. She slowly begins to descend from the sky. We rush over to where Mia is landing and catch her. Holding her, we can only mutter her name. Elk makes his way back to the field and sees us holding on to Mia. He rushes over to her side. He begins to cast a healing spell, but it immediately fails to work. Elk angrily asks what we have done to Mia. Mia opens her eyes and looks over at Elk and begins to thank him for everything that he has done for her. She then begins to glow. We grasp onto her tightly as she fades away into nothing. We both look up at the remains of Mia as they ascend upwards into the sky. Leos opens communications and informs us that the data that vanished earlier has returned. He requests that we go back to the previous field to resume the operation. We get up, knowing that this heartache is still present, but we must push forward if we are to put an end to all of those whose lives are held in the balance. We try to console Elk, but also don't know what to say. Elk gets to his feet, infuriated, and tells us to leave him alone, slowly walking away before gating out. As we return to town, Leos pings us again, telling us to hurry back to the previous location. Back in the dungeon, Leos asks if we know where Elk is at. We don't go into details, but tell him we parted ways back during the last location, and if something is wrong. Leos tells us that Elk left his position with the vaccine, and the final drive won't be, but the communications get severed, and we can no longer hear Leos. We can't let this stop us. We must make it further down the dungeon. We make it lower and communications with Leos have picked back up. Leos informs us that we are aborting the operation. We press for more details. He tells us that the virus has eaten the vaccine and now has created an antibody. All of Leos's men have been wiped out. He requests that we return to town. We ask what he means by wiped out. Could he mean put into a coma? Right before leaving, we are met with Aura. Another fragment we recovered leaves us and returns back to her. Leos resumes communications. He asks what is going on. The momentum of the wave has stopped. We can resume the operation. The room begins to shake. The floor transforms. Rising from the empty void of a floor rises Kubia, more massive than before. Purple roots spanning from the base outward across as far as the eye can see. In awe of how gigantic Kubia is now, Aura pleads with us to run, that we cannot fight Kubia before fading away. Kubia's core will shift from magical tolerance and physical tolerance. It will summon others to help, such as Reth Gamora, Kill Gamora, Various Gamora, and Downer Gamora. Kubia can summon lightning that will strike and hit all party members multiple times. Legion's Reach, moving its branches from underneath that lashes out at each player. Arc Bullet, it spits out three energy blasts to hit each player. Megiddo Flame, expelling fiery orbs from its neck that seeks out all players and splashes down onto them. And Chaos Gehenna, which summons a large void into the platform, hitting each party member multiple times. Kubia, blowing out purple smoke from its mouth upon defeat, ascends upwards to escape and teleports into a rift out of our reach. We bring up how Kubia doesn't want us to meet Aura. Every time we see her, it appears. Black Rose agrees, and Leos mentions that the wave has resumed its movement, but they are unable to determine where it is moving to. We decide to regroup back in town. Wiseman tells us we still have a chance if we herd it to our other route. Leos mentions how his men have been hospitalized, and asks how we plan to herd it. Helba arrives and tells Leos that plans are thought up with failures in mind. She mentions that everyone will help us with the plan. Suddenly, all of our friends arrive. Mistral, Sandra, Natsume, Gardenia, Nuke, Rachel, Moonstone, Terajima, Marlow, and Piros. Helba also mentions that we now have an improved vaccine, so we can resume the operation. Leos is speechless. Helba heard about what happened to Leos' men, but for their sake, can he really afford to stop now? Leos can't find the words, but agrees with Helba. He announces the operation will resume, to which everyone shouts in unison that they are all in. Helba instructs everyone to go into their positions. Everyone gives words of encouragement. Even Mistral returns after she quit playing due to being pregnant and not wanting to risk her life or her child's saying that we can't just let it be, for even she wants her kid to play a game as great as this one day. Helba tells us that we will form a fighting party and stand at the lowest level of the dungeon. Black Rose tells us that she is going to be in our fighting party. Back at the dungeon, Leos informs us that the perimeter has been successfully surrounded. The next wave has nowhere to go, so we are confronted by the next wave phase, Tarvos the Avenger. Tarvos will have magic and physical tolerances, but change between the two by playing a cutscene
cutscene of it crying. Then it will bury itself and move further away. It will use Earthquake that hits the ground and damages all party members close to the impact. It will rain nails, which it will make multiple small versions of its nail that will pelt a single target. It will also cast Dark Elemental Magic, summoning demonic hands from below, which each finger hits the target. It can also cast Slow onto a player, restricting its movement speed. It can paralyze a target, restricting it from doing any actions. And it can put a party member to sleep. It has a move called Malice Light, where it will summon rainbow lights that spiral and floats to the sky, then begin to descend onto all party members then explode upon impact. It can also use Cursed Play. Tarvos will cry into a mud puddle, summoning a clay puppet of a target of its choosing. It will then remove its nail and launch it at the clay puppet, piercing it through the body, transferring all the damage to its player counterpart and data drain, which will apply all debuffs onto a single target of its choosing. When weakened enough, you can data drain it to its stone form. In its stone form, it still retains its earthquake ability, dark magic ability, and sleep ability. Tarvos cracks and crumbles, leaving nothing behind. Black Rose mentions that there is only one more phase to go. However, we mentioned that we still need to deal with Kubia. Back in town, players from the Net slums await our arrival. They each say something cryptic, even to Targa, right before logging out. On the boards, we see a post about players discussing the old group, the Crimson Knights. Someone invites Lady Subaru to a dungeon, if she's still around. So we save the location in hopes of seeing if she'll show up. We receive mail from our friends. Black Rose tells us to look at the boards. The Net slum players who were speaking in code went and posted field locations on the board of data bugs they tracked down. Tatarga also sends us mail. He says how he once spoke with a wandering AI named Harold. After talking, he asked, Where is the sanctuary? He didn't know what he was talking about, but persisted, so he told him, That you know about it the best. To which Harold mumbled, That is true. I think it was in this field. Tatarga believes we should check it out. Marla asks if we can accompany him in a dungeon, if we have the time. Rachel has another business idea. She wants to have a rescue service. She's already getting messages after posting about it on the message boards. We also receive messages from both Black Rose and Terajima. They ask us to join them in getting an item from the same dungeon. We also get scrambled messages from Aura that reads, I'm sorry, Kite. I wanted you to kill Morgana, but because of it, Orca, I am sorry. Do not fight with Kubia. Kubia is yours and the bracelet's shadow. To defeat Kubia is to destroy the bracelet. Do not fight with Kubia yet. We head with Marlo into the dungeon. We ask what the goal of the quest is. A monster? An item? But he just tells us to shut up and go on ahead. We find ourselves in a room filled with treasure chests. We ask Marlo, what is all of this? To which he tells us that there are resurrection and power-up items in the treasure boxes. We thank him for getting us here, and he tells us to hurry up and collect the items so we can go back. Marlo may have a tough exterior, but deep down, he cares for his friends. Next, we go to the dungeon posted on the boards for the former leader of the Crimson Knights, Lady Subaru. Going through the entire dungeon, we do not see anyone until we reach the treasure room. We turn around and see Krim, a former member of the Crimson Knights. He tells us that if we are waiting for Subaru, it's a waste of our time. She doesn't, about to tell us that she stopped playing the game before stopping himself. He says he can't help us, but he's rooting for us. Then he says goodbye while calling us a celebrity. Afterwards, we can find A20, Krim, Mimiru, and Bear around the root towns. We now assist Rachel in her dungeon rescue service. In the dungeon, she gives us the rundown. We have a client by the name of Taro we're looking to help. Once we see a player, we introduce ourselves, who turns out to be our client. They tell us their friend is stuck on the lowest level of the dungeon. Rachel emulates the situation. Their friend is being attacked by monsters and needs us to rescue them. Taro shuts down the idea and says his friend has defeated the monsters but ran out of resurrect items and wants us to deliver them some items. We receive the items and have our goal to reach the lowest level of the dungeon. During our dungeon crawl, we run into another player by the name of Hanako. They tell us that they got a message from a friend to get items, but they can't seem to locate them. Exploring deeper down, we come across another player and introduce ourselves. Turns out, it's the friend of our client. He mixes up the rescue service from our previous delivery service, to which Rachel clarifies, we are the rescue service. The client has the item they need, but now needs us to take items back to their friend that we met earlier in the dungeon. Rachel clarifies again that our job is to rescue people, not to deliver items. But the client mentions that if we don't take the items, they can't continue, so in a way, it's rescuing them. The player's name is Hanako, and is higher up in the dungeon, and since we already met them, we know where to go. Meeting up with Hanako, we hand over the items, and they pay us for our service, and thank us for making the journey. Rachel laments that in the end, we turn into an item delivery service. We try to comfort Rachel, and point out that the client was happy we were able to help, which gives Rachel some optimism that no matter what the job is, if there are clients that are happy, then it's fine. Next, we go with Black Rose and Terajima to the dungeon for the rare item. 
Upon arriving in the field, Terajima notices Black Rose is partying with us to the dungeon, and Black Rose notices Terajima and presumes that she has business here as well, to which Terajima asks if that is going to be a problem, which Black Rose says that it's not. We stay quiet, but hope this won't be an issue. Entering the dungeon, Terajima points out that the dungeon splits into two directions. Black Rose believes the right doorway is the shorter path, but Terajima thinks the left is the correct path. Both members stare at us as we think of which direction to pick. Regardless which way you pick will matter at the end. At the next fork, Terajima again picks the left side, and Black Rose picks the right. The two bicker over their chosen path. We try to break the tension, saying which path doesn't matter, but both in unison yell at us, arguing that the path does matter, and we're left making the decision which way to go. At the final fork, Terajima rushes over to the left pathway, claiming that this is the correct way. Black Rose mimics Terajima's actions and rushes to the right pathway, and claiming that her path is the true way to go. We can't help but blurt out our frustration and ask what is wrong with the two of them. Black Rose claims there isn't anything wrong, and Terajima agrees. Again, both of them ask for us to choose a direction and to make their choice quickly. In the next room, Black Rose and Terajima resume their fight, while we can only sulk. The two confront each other. Terajima asks why they came to this dungeon in the first place, to which Black Rose points out that she invited us to go with her. Terajima asks what she said is true, to which we come clean. We tell them that we are invited by both Black Rose and Terajima. This revelation doesn't sit well with either of them. We apologize and ask if they really expected for us to choose to come with only one of them. Black Rose doesn't believe this is an appropriate response and tells us that we are the only ones who can answer our own question. And Terajima agrees fully with Black Rose's sentiment. Black Rose pushes the whole situation off, saying she doesn't care about it anymore, while Terajima suggests that maybe we should just go back. But right as things seem to resolve, Black Rose says that they are going down the right pathway, and Terajima says that she will go down the left pathway, and the two split ways, leaving us behind to go ahead solo. By the end, the treasure you get depends on who you chose the most, out of Terajima or Black Rose. If you chose Black Rose's path two out of three times, you get the rare item, the Sunfang. And if you chose Terajima's path two out of three times, you get Subaru's axe from Dot Hack Sign. After collecting whichever rare item, we express how pathetic we are by the end of this whole ordeal. We investigate all the fields given to us from the usuals of the net slums. Each field given has a guardian monster, the very same that we saw in the anime Dot Hack Sign. Each boss room contains a virus bug, and when data drained, gives us one of the four virus cores needed to reaching the AI Herald within the system. Black Rose waits near the gate for our arrival and proceeds to ask if we are planning to go see Harold. She insists on coming with and wants to ask Harold why all of this is happening and what he plans to accomplish. In the area, we reach a white room with a giant stone slab floating above a single rocking chair. Surrounding it are picture frames all turned around. When viewed from the back, all the pictures have images of people with their faces removed, and the only photo faced normally above the stone is that of a woman, presumably Emma Whelan. The stone lights up and begins to speak. Who goes there? Who are you? We ask if this stone is Harold. The stone responds and says its name is Harold. Black Rose is confused. After all, how can a giant rock be Harold? Even for viewers of the anime Dot Hack Sign, the last time we saw the AI Harold, he looked more like his human counterpart. Black Rose confronts Harold and asks if they are responsible for the cursed waves and demands that they fix this. Harold denies any connection to the wave, saying that the passage of time is irreversible. Birth or death, now there are only two choices left. Black Rose doesn't understand what Harold means. Then, our bracelet begins to glow, and Aura arrives. Aura, the child of light, Emma's daughter, Harold's daughter, and says, Just a little more. Everything Harold is saying isn't making any sense. We ask Aura about the last time we met, about how they mentioned that we shouldn't fight Kubia, and ask why. Aura explains that Kubia is a shadow, and that when there is a light burning in the darkness, a shadow is born. When the bracelet appeared in the world, Kubia was born as well. The bracelet and Kubia are the opposite sides of the same coin. Therefore, if we defeat Kubia, the bracelet will also be destroyed. We believe that Kubia must already know that, and is the reason why it always retreats. Aura informs us that Kubia no longer retreats now, that she has finally been released. We ask for more details, but before we can get our answers, Leos tells us a massive amount of data believed to be the wave is heading in our direction. AI Herald tells us to take something to heart, that it is the darkest before the dawn. Then the room begins to shake, and we hear the noise. Aura warns us, 
telling us to run away before it is too late, but we aren't running anymore. This time, we will defeat Kubia. But again, Aura tries to warn us before suddenly, the stone AI herald begins to crack and explode. The floor becomes divided into a grid, each tile falling down to nothingness. Aura leaves, while we too, like the floor, fall into a black void. During our freefall, we begin to see roots, which could only be that of Kubia. We land, and the roots are so large that we can walk on them now. We will need to walk on them to reach Kubia. Kubia's core will appear, and will shift back and forth between magical and physical tolerances. Again, it will also spawn a Reth Gamora, Kill Gamora, Various Gamora, and Downer Gamora. It will attack using Legion's Reach, moving its branches from underneath as it lashes out at each player. It will summon lightning that will strike and hit all party members multiple times. It will use Chaos Gehenna, which summons a large void into the platform, hitting each player multiple times. And Sodom's Curse. It launches a large ball of shifting skulls down that crashes onto the party. Once reaching Kubia, it will also start using Abdon's Terror, which will apply random debuffs to all party members. Appearing defeated, Kubia gets a second wind, erupting with power that even shatters the walls. This time, Kubia isn't running away, and neither are we. On Kubia's second wind, it'll still use Abdon's Terror, Sodom's Curse, and Chaos Gehenna, but it'll also use Arc Bullet, spitting out three energy blasts to hit each player, and Armageddon. It gathers energy into its mouth and unleashes a beam onto all party members. After defeating Kubia, it begins to cast Seraphah Returner, restoring all of its health back to full. Exhausted, Black Rose asks if we believe we can truly defeat Kubia. We look down and see our bracelet begin to glow, and think of a way to defeat Kubia. We ask for Black Rose to strike our bracelet. She seems confused by the request, and thinks it's ridiculous, but we explain that if Kubia and the bracelet are two sides of the same coin, then attacking the bracelet should settle it. Black Rose knows the bracelet is our only tool of stopping the wave, but we tell her that right now we're in danger, and Kubia is a greater threat. She becomes hesitant, and tries to think of another way to get out of this, but we can't wait. We must act now, and if we must, we will do it ourselves. Black Rose caves in, and agrees to help destroy the bracelet. Black Rose is ready. We are ready. We both lunge towards each other with all of our might and connect the bracelet with her blade. Sparks fly with Kubia feeling the pain of it all. An explosion of energy knocks both Black Rose and us back. Electricity and energy surround us and the bracelet. Then a chip of the bracelet falls and disintegrates into data. The damage is done and we are now experiencing pain beyond what we have felt so far. The bracelet begins to shift and expand into all of its individual parts before turning into a tempest all shooting outward toward Kubia's core destroying all of Kubia's connection to the bracelet. And with that tie severed, Kubia begins to digitize and fade away into nothing. With Kubia gone, we are left in an open field. Black Rose points out that now we have lost our only weapon to defeating the wave. We point out that the enemy has also lost Kubia as well, and we still have Aura. We try to stay optimistic and say that there must be another way to defeat the wave. Helba arrives at our location. She informs us that she has called the operation personnel and that we should have a conversation back in town. We start the next meeting and bring up that the bracelet was lost in our battle with Kubia. Leo springs up how the bracelet is the only tool to oppose the wave, which reminds Wise Man of a section of the epitaph, power, all now to droplets, and the world dwindles into twilight. We question that, is it really twilight? Which intrigues Helba and asks for us to elaborate. The key is Aura. When we look at her, we don't think the world is facing its dusk, but rather its dawn, meaning daybreak. At least, it feels that way to us. Helba mentions that the word twilight means both dusk and dawn. Leos doesn't see the connection, so we mentioned that if Harold designed this world based on the epitaph of daybreak, then would he have prepared an end where the world is destroyed by the wave? Belmong understands and believes that we still have a chance. Harold once said, it is darkest before the dawn, and we should believe in him. Black Rose asks what we plan to do. Out of our sight, we can see Elk watching and hearing our operation plan, to herd the wave to the same area as before, and after that, we fight it head on. It's a gamble, but it's worth doing. However, it is also a fact that it is going to be dangerous. Leos lets everyone know that from here, this won't be an order or an obligation. Anyone who will not join are free to leave and gate out. Anyone who remains after a three count are all in. Leos begins to count down. Three, two, one. And so it's decided. Bal Mung has a suggestion. He asks if we test our method first on a data bug, but Helba shoots the idea down, since we unfortunately don't have the time for any test runs, since we are the ones who are cornered right now. And with that, a tremor starts, and we hear the noise. Helba informs us that the data is increasing, and the wave is coming. We are now confronted by the eighth phase, Corbinic, the rebirth.
Korbanek will shoot seeds out from top of its head. Each will have a 5 second timer. If not defeated in time, each undestroyed seed will erupt. It will use Earthquake, but unlike all other Earthquakes before, it will jump around, striking the floor, causing multiple zones of damage if a player is within range. It will also summon a massive tree that spirals and grows on a target, while hitting anyone within its growth range. Mid-fight, Korbanek will shift its appearance, sprouting leaves that then grow so large that the seed shrinks away to nothing, leaving only the leaf. Phase 2 of Korbanek also has Earthquake that hits the ground and damages all party members close to the impact. It will use Wood Elemental Magic that will cause 3 simultaneous tornadoes on a player, and it can paralyze, but unlike all other times before, it can paralyze all party members at the same time. It'll use moves like Malicious Quickening, where it duplicates itself and surrounds one party member. Each leaf then tackles the player until no leaves remain. Cruel Exploitation roots itself to a player and saps away their health and skill points and Fierce Flash. It pulls energy from the earth into the sky, then chain lightning between one another until they fall to the ground and erupt upon impact on all party members. Further in the fight, Corbinic Phase 2 will glow and will now have a bright green barrier surrounding it called Supreme Defense. With Supreme Defense, all of our attacks become void. The fight continues and Balmung starts to lose hope. Black Rose tries to keep morale up saying we'll lose if we give up. We shout at Korbanek to give us our friend Orca back. Aura arrives, along with all of the spirits of the players currently in comas. Orca, Kazu, Sieg, the CC Corp employees, and Sora. All of them in unison thrust at Korbanek, weakening its shield. Balmung and Black Rose both attack the shield, and we follow up with our finishing blow, shattering the shield, leaving Korbanek exposed. Korbanek takes this opportunity to begin its next phase shift. Flower petals begin to rain from the sky, enveloping the area in darkness. Cutting through the darkness are two eyes, staring directly at us. The room turns bright white as the eyes begin to multiply and ascend upwards, which they then spirals around, and now we see the next phase of Korbanek, a massive eye. The third phase of Korbanek will expel a ball from itself that will fall and become three balls, Varya Seeker, Hell Seeker, and Rep Seeker. Korbanek 3 can also use Earthquake, which hits the ground and damages all party members close to the impact. It will also use a move called Grand Complication. It'll multiply itself and surround the party. It'll bounce energy blasts from one eye to another while it ricochets off the party, and it will use Vivid Purification. It focuses a mass amount of energy, then unleashes it onto the party. Korbanek begins to play the white noise. Then suddenly, all the eyes disappear. Searching around, we can't find any sign of Korbanek. Helba notices something is wrong with the server. It cannot sustain, and is beginning to crash. We were so close to beating Korbanek. The server recovers, and Korbanek returns. Helba isn't sure what happened, but is certain that her server is dead. Thanks to Mai, Tokuoka, and the gang, they were able to swap the server before it could crash and comatose us. Regardless, we need to end this now. Korbanek can also use Data Drain, that applies all debuffs onto a single target of its choosing. Korbanek cracked and defeated, but isn't going down without a fight, and summons the bracelet and unleashes Drain Heart to surround us before targeting us one by one. First, it goes after Balmung, and makes contact, reducing him to nothing. Next, it makes contact with Black Rose. It then sets its sights on us, but right before it is able to hit us, Elk pushes us out of harm's way and takes the hit on our behalf. Elk apologizes about before, on how he was only thinking about himself, before falling over and fading away. Not wasting this opportunity Elk has given us, we march forward. The next phase of Drainheart rushes towards us as we outrun it. More attacks come from the flooring as we nimbly avoid our certain doom. With our dagger ready and Corbin in sight, the only thing on our mind is to end it once and for all. Lunging at Korbanek with all of our might, we are stopped by Aura, our dagger resting in Aura's body. Her body begins to glow, and her last words are, Mother. Her body breaking into small parts and dispersing before plunging into Korbanek, which is too much for it to handle, and erupts, leaving only a faint presence of Aura, allowing all the trapped players to finally be freed. The players previously comatose resume back in the Omega server. Orca. Sieg, Terajima, Rachel, Sanjuro, Natsume, Piros, Moonstone, Nuke, Gardenia, and also Kazu. Helba monitors the data and sees that it is now stabilized, and the battle is now finally over. We mention how we heard Aura in her final moments. Balmung says that Aura is now born, both her and Morgana. Balmung says, To be born, they may have had to die first. Wise Man sees the similarities with the life and death cycle of apoptosis. Black Rose says that the world is always being changed by everyone's hearts. Mistral feels her baby kicking. 
Leos asks if it's finally over. Staring at the dawn, we say, it's just begun. A few months later, Orca and I started our journey again. Receiving words from our friends after the whole ordeal, CC Corp, or rather Leos, thanks us for our assistance in normalizing the world system, and tells us to enjoy the true form of the game. Black Rose tells us that Kazu has recovered, and everything has settled down, so she suggests a rap party. We can actually watch this rap party in the Dot .hack unison special, where the protagonists of Dot .hack sign meet up with the heroes of the Dot .hack IMOQ games. Mistral asks if we would come over for dinner sometime. Wise Man says he's going to a soccer match at his local school, and asks for us to come by and support him. Belmont Mung tells us he got a new bike, and maybe we should go for a ride together. Sanjuro tells us that while Samurai no longer exists in Japan, he shall visit us next year from South Dakota. Gardenia simply says that she would like to see us. Marlo asks about our friend, who was put into a coma, and is glad to know that he is doing better. Rachel wants us to be business partners, for now. Nuke is going to perform in Shinjuku, and would like us to stop by and watch. Terajima wants us to meet her father. Finally, we get a message from Aura. She wants to give us something, but would like us and Orca to go to the field where we first met her. Logging into town, we have all of our friends waiting for us, including Orca. After touching base with our friends, we follow up with Orca. He gives us a hard time, telling us that we're late, and how he can only play for an hour nowadays. Orca must have gotten the same email from Aura, and mentions the field location. In the dungeon, we see Aura, which gives Orca some bad flashbacks. Aura tells us the same thing she told us before, that the power of the bracelet can bring forth either salvation or destruction at the whim of the user. She then then follows up by asking us what this means and gives us the Book of Twilight, Daybreak. It gives us the bracelet again, which returns our ability to data drain and gate hack. Aura then leaves. On the boards, we see someone mention that they saw a cat-like character. Aura gives us a field location and tells us that this is her birthplace. This is where her mother was born, and now another life is about to be born. However, something wishes to prevent this new birth from happening. Only we can stop the same mistake. Logging in, we are met with Elk, who also received an email from Aura, and asks that he come with to the field Aura provided. In the dungeon, we are met with the cat-like character, who we know as Maha from Dihak Sign. Both us and and Elk are surprised not to see Mia. Maha simply bows towards us, before turning away and leaving through a portal. Elk pleads for Maha not to go. Elk believes that Maha is Mia. Whatever remains of her is still alive. We might be able to help, and now our only path is to move forward. Further in, Maha appears again. Elk calls out to Mia, asking Maha if they truly are Mia. Maha mumbles and retreats again. Later, we come across a guardian monster called Dawn Wanderer. After defeating Dawn Wanderer, White Noise begins to play as Dawn Wanderer fades away and its center ring begins to fall, but stops mid-fall for it to reform and build a new structure around it, and in the center is Maha. It now becomes the Temptress Lover. When the Temptress Lover is defeated, Maha and the Temptress Lover start to transform and glow. Then out of the glow emerges Mia. We rush over and Elk is excited to see Mia again. Mia is surprised to see Elk. When seeing us, she seems confused. She then says the same thing she told us when we first met about how we have a unique bracelet. She then continues to reenact by asking to take a look at our bracelet as she reaches for our hand. Worried, Elk points out how something is wrong with Mia's memories. We too recreate the moment we first met Mia, asking her if she can see the bracelet, to which she responds with, yes, of course. Do you mean to say you can't see this nice bracelet? Even if you can't see it, as long as you know it's there, it's the same thing as seeing it, right? We answer sadly, yes, it is. Again, Elk sulks as he mentions Mia's memories. We try to comfort Elk, telling him it's all going to be alright because he'll be with her. Elk says he will always be with Mia and help her remember things. Elk then tells us to call him again if we're going to play the world. Both him and Mia will be waiting. Mia and Elk leave together, hand in hand. We watch them leave together in happiness as the screen fades to black. If you've made it all the way to the end of the video, I just want to give you a huge thank you. If you've watched all of the dot .hack videos I've put out so far, I want to even give a bigger thanks to you, since I wouldn't be going through all of this if it wasn't for you guys. If you haven't already, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. I have the social medias listed on the screen right now, as well as links to another video you might be interested in. If you have any suggestions for another full story video, please let me know in the comments down below. Until then, I'll see you later.